Okay, I am very excited to have here on the Goldstein on Gelt show, Dr. Harry Markowitz, who is an economist, the recipient of the John von Neumann Theory Prize, as well as the Nobel Prize in Economics. He's best known, I think, for his work in modern portfolio theory. And I have to say that I would like to thank you for the work that you've done in modern portfolio theory, because all of your work has become the cornerstone of the work that I do as a financial advisor. Dr. Markowitz, real pleasure to have you. My pleasure. So before we get into all the details, can you give us a layman's definition of modern portfolio theory? No, I can't give you a definition, uh, but I can give you a brief description. Take a couple of minutes. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Okay. So when somebody, when you or an institutional investor or advisor applies portfolio theory, at the heart of this application is a computer program, which we call a portfolio optimizer. And like computer programs, it has inputs and outputs. The output, do a couple of outputs. One is a risk, uh, a risk return trade-off curve. It shows you what's the most return you can get on the average for a given uh, level of risk, or the least risk you can have to put up for a given level of return. And it's a trade-off curve. It's, you know, you can uh, you can go for uh, low low risk, but you have low return, or you can go up the curve and get higher uh, return, but for more risk. And then behind each of the other uh, output of this. This program is behind each of these uh, risk return combinations is a portfolio of, you know combination of securities that give this um, the, this risk and return output. Um, that's the outputs of the um, of the analysis. The inputs see the outputs are just the logical consequences of the inputs. The input is a, some user like some institution decides on what its investables are. Maybe it does the analysis at the asset class level or particular or at the security level. But for each of the investable securities, let's say, it has to supply an expected return, you know, an average return on the long run. It's got a, 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 a supply an estimate of the volatility or uncertainty of the return. It's got to esti- uh, supply estimates of the correlations between each security and each other, or some kind of a model from which these correlations can be derived. And then finally, it, it puts it uh, states constraints: uh, don't invest too much in this security, don't invest too much in this industry, and so on. And then what the mathematics does, what the computer does, is to figure out that curve. The back, you know, given your constraints and your estimates, it figure out what the maximum return you can get uh, for a given level of, um, of uh, risk. So in simpler terms, a lot of people will feel, they'll say, well, I'm, I've always heard that if I'm willing to take more risk, I'm going to make more money. But that's not a true statement, is it? No, um, there's there's off, there's ways of taking risk, <laughs> which will uh, uh, not not be efficient, as we say, uh, which will uh, uh, you know you <laughs> you can gamble. I mean, you can buy lottery tickets. You're taking more risks, and you'll probably lose, like most people will. So, so um, and also uh, this analysis is a framework which helps think through the consequences for portfolios of your own estimates for risk and return on the individual securities and their correlations. So if you're over if you're over optimistic on the inputs and do something really stupid like leverage, uh, you know, highly, and you get wiped out on a, uh, a downturn, don't blame me. <laughs> All right. So you heard it here. Don't blame Harry Markowitz if you get wiped out. <laughs> one of the one of the concepts I think that portfolio modern portfolio theory relates to is that people shouldn't just look at one asset, but should rather look at how each of the assets correlates and works together, which is why we always talk to people about designing a whole portfolio and not just looking at, at one thing at a time. Is that a, a good summary? That's excellent. Um, the... Uh, I think it's all it, it, it's all summarized uh, in the title of my 1952 paper, my, my first paper on the subject. It was called Portfolio Selection, and uh, that was the, the, the novel, the insight that, as far as anal- the, the analysis goes, you should think about the portfolio as a whole. Okay. I say the analysis because people knew about diversification before, uh, you know, Shakespeare, uh, the. Uh, 
uh, Mer- Merchant of Venice. Somebody says, Antonio, are you? You know, are you? You're, you look sad. Uh, uh, is your business going bad? And he says, um, My goods are not to one uh, bottom trusted, nor my fortune to just this one year, and my, and so on. So he he knew about diversification. Well, it actually all goes back all the way to Talmudic times because I know. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That you should put in three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. I don't. I don't mean to. You're, you're right. I was thinking to myself, I should have should have said that. But well, go you're, ahead. You're, you're closer to those times. Than I am. I know you're a little bit older than I am, which is uh, lucky for me because I've gotten to follow some of your work. We're talking to Dr. Harry Markowitz, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, who did work in modern portfolio theory. So let's cut to the chase and, as we say, talk tachlis. These days, the markets feel crazy, and I've been doing this something like 25 years working as a financial advisor. And every time we go through this kind of upheaval, I hear from clients, you know, well, maybe this time it's different and look at what's going on with oil or this problem or that problem. What is the best way for an advisor like me to help clients through these rough markets when we're applying your theories? I, I work for a uh, an outfit uh, uh, called uh, Guided Choice. It's my every Thursday place I go. And uh, I wrote a little piece, I think, in 2000 either 2000, 2008, maybe towards the end of 2008, I wrote a, a, a piece uh, uh, for, for, you know, for them to distribute to their, uh, their clients saying, uh, uh, the sky is falling, what do I do now? <laughs> and, um, and then I said, uh, the piece sort of went like this. It, it said, well, now that you know what a standard deviation feels like or a two standard deviation move feels like, in real time, maybe instead of going high so high on the frontier, uh, we have seven portfolio uh, f- seven part portfolios from uh, one is the most chicken and seven is the most aggressive. So instead of being at six and seven uh, up at you know the high end, you should come down to four or five, but not with the intention that you're going to move back up at, at you know when things are better, because the chief uh, error which uh, the small investor makes is they buy when the market has gone up and they assume it's going to go up further uh, and then they sell when the market has gone down and they think it's going to go uh, down you know more whereas the institutional investor or the, uh, the, you know, the financial advisor does something which is called rebalancing you start off maybe with a 60 40 mix but when the market goes up uh, it's now 70 30 and you sell off the seven you know the 10 percent so you get back to 60 40 so you're 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 selling it when it's high then buy when it's, if it goes down instead of being 60 40 you're 50 50 so you buy one slow so you know if you take the complete cycle from what where the market was let's say in 2007 and then you go all the way down and then you come back up to it's up there again some people have lost money but some people have made money. Mm-hmm. So the small investor who dumped at the bottom and you know who bought at the top and dumped at the bottom, he lost money, and my folks made money. Hmm. I think that one of the reasons that people mess themselves up is, in fact, not because they're, they, the rules are wrong that you're describing. It's just that people tend to mess themselves up. You know, there's a, as you know, there's a whole theory of behavioral finance, people like... Right, uh, yeah. Danny Kahneman, you know, who, who right. won the Nobel Prize in that, and Terry O'Dean on your coast. Uh, both yeah, I was going to say Terry O'Dean has some wonderful uh, work out on, um, you know, the kinds of mistakes that, is, that individuals make. They trade too much, he says, uh, especially men. <laughs> <laughs> right. He spoke about that actually on the Goldstein on Gelt show. If anyone oh, wants to hear what, uh, what uh, Dr. Mark's, Markowitz is referring to, just go to YouTube and look up Goldstein on Gelt and Terrence O'Dean. You can also look up Goldstein on Gelt and Daniel Kahneman to hear the interviews we've had on behavioral finance. But my, so my question to you is, is there something that people can do when they realize that your systems are reasonable in order to stop themselves from messing themselves up? Okay. If they don't have a financial advisor, let's suppose they, you know, they're like, this is the advice I give to waitresses that uh, <laughs> ask me. Um, they should... Um, uh, uh, find a balance between stocks and bonds, or or bonds are complicated, so stocks and savings account, and um, they should buy a well diversified 
a portfolio, you get an investment company, you know, uh, uh, Vanguard is the usual, you know, <laughs> is, is this inexpensive, well-diversified, uh, this offers that they, they offer a lot of other things, but uh, portfolio, and but they should get a balance between stocks and bonds. So if the, if the stock market went down, uh, 38 or 40 percent, you know, the big caps went down 38 percent in 2008. If the market goes down 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent, maybe some horrible event, um, but it's going to come back up eventually, they're not going to chicken out. So if they have half bonds, half stocks, you know, uh, my, 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 night, my simple regress, um, suggestion, as I say to the waitresses, uh, is put half your money in stocks, half your money in uh, the savings account, uh, uh, or 60-40 if you're young, or, uh, or, or young, younger you can go all stocks. But, uh, but make sure that you stick with the program. And as far as rebalancing, well, that gets a little complicated for, um, you know, that, leave that to the institutional investors. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you one of the, the things that I discovered recently, I was working in the in on a book about how the strategies of chess can be applied to investing. I wrote uh-huh. the book with a world chess champion, Susan Polgar. And in, in the book, what we realized was that all of the behavioral finance models that Kahneman and Odin talk about, all those problems seem to affect chess players as well. And when I was talking to Susan, I was explaining to her what, what we study in the world of finance. She was nodding her head and saying, yeah, this is exactly the same type of problem that that you know, or disease that infects the mind of a chess grandmaster. So I think that having a system like you're describing that you're just going to stick to is the most important thing, even if it's not the best system. Having any system is better than having nothing at all. Well, I don't know about that because some people may uh, have bad uh, systems. <laughs> they, they may do uh, momentum. You know, they may they may be. Uh, they, they have a system that if it went up, it's going to go up, and and if they don't diversify, if they follow that system and don't diversify, uh, you know, in chess, uh, <laughs> you got to know a little something. Uh, you can get clock, you can get a fool's mate, you know, almost instantly if you uh, if you have a you know a bad system. But but you, but it's true that what modern portfolio theory supplies is a framework. And um, you've got to use it in such a way that you're going to stick with it. Otherwise, uh, you know, otherwise it's going to be useless. One of the tools that a lot of financial advisors use in order to develop the asset allocation model is they'll use a Monte Carlo simulation, which is basically right. testing many, many, many different possible market scenarios right. yes. in a certain asset allocation model. Do you think this is a reasonable tool for people to bet their future on? Uh, yes, but before I answer that question, uh, let me go back to the chess sure. uh, situation. There's one major difference between chess and investing. <laughs> Dr. Mark, uh, you're ruining the thesis of my book. Stop, stop. No, no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I'm a consultant, and i got to call it as I see it. Otherwise, if I'm a yes man, I have absolutely no value <laughs> to my clients. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the, the the difference is that um, with chess there's a rule book, and with finance, you know, it is true that every time it is different. Every time there's uncertainty. Every time, but you know, the world keeps keeps changing. Uh, like uh, you know, the 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 think of the twenty, you know, the twenties, the thirties, you know, with Hitler. Uh, think of you know the, uh, the, the, the the things that are going on now. Um, they they all have effect on uh, uh, you know you, you're still trying to get uh, control risk uh, and get return on your portfolio as a whole, but you always have to do these forward looking. Uh, what things are more uncertain? What things do I have to uh, diversify against? Okay, now uh, now. Uh, remind me again, Mon- what was the, uh, Actually, uh, the I, other question? We, we were talking about Monte Carlo simulation, but I just want to... Monte Carlo, so let me tell you about Monte Carlo simulation. I said that there is a risk-return frontier. Uh, you know, uh, there's various combinations of risk and return you can get. 
Uh, the analysis is a one-period analysis. In other words, we want to get a good probability distribution of return between now and, let's say, next year. And then next year, we'll get a good probability distribution of return from then to the year after that. And maybe if, we, if our beliefs don't change, we will rebalance. But suppose I'm 25 years old. I expect I'm saving up for uh, my retirement at 65. I want a good probability distribution of uh, of what you know, of what my portfolio will, what my wealth will be like at uh, 65, and um, the the state of the art is to uh, do Monte Carlo simulation, taking into account, uh, uh, you know, you, you you have some kind of model of uh, even even though the world is uncertain, you need some kind of model of how uh, prices evolve or how returns evolve. Um, and you have to randomly draw over and over again, but you also take into account what you know what wealth uh, this person has now, he or she, uh, this, the rate at which they're saving. It's a 401k. Uh, you, uh, uh, what is the rate at which the employer will match, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So thinking through the consequences of of any particular point on the uh, risk-return trade-off curve is not a trivial thing, and Monte Carlo helps you pick the right point on the curve. So the, the bottom line is that for someone who's trying to develop a long-term financial plan, a Monte Carlo simulation is a good tool to help get a sense of, of where he might be going within a certain, let's say, ba- bandwidth of volatility. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, there's no pinpoint I mean, because the world is uncertain and there's more my, the, the impact of my uh, prior remark is there's more uncertainty than we actually put in our models because we have to make a model and that's uncertain. But there's, but there's a lot of randomness in our in any any reasonable model, and we would like uh, you know, we know that on the average over the long run uh, stocks have uh, done well, and we assume that on the average over the long run they will they will do well. But there's um, a randomness in it, and depending on whether you're going to retire five years from now or fifty, you know, forty years from now, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Monte Carlo is not the kind of thing which a um, individual is able to do for themselves. So one of the benefits of having an advisor who who in turn has some kind of a uh, you know su- support from some large institutional investor that that supplies frontiers and Monte Carlo and so on. Uh, one of the advantages of, if, you know, if you can, is of having advisors, they can uh, help you pick out the right point on the frontier uh, using in part uh, Monte, Car- Monte Carlo. Right. And we certainly do that. And we, we do our very best. Although, as you have pointed out, there always is going to be an element of randomness. Dr. Markowitz, we are just about out of time. We've been talking with Harry Markowitz, the Nobel Prize winner in economics. In the last few seconds, could you just tell us how can people follow your work and f- follow the, the new ideas you're, you're working on these days? Well, uh, the uh, I'm, I'm currently <laughs> writing volume three of a four-volume book, and uh, so volume one is out. It's called uh, uh, Risk Return Analysis, uh, and the subtitle is uh, uh, <laughs> I'm blanking. Uh, so the subtitle is uh, 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 The Theory and Practice of Rational Investing. Uh, but this is really for the uh, student and the and the quant person and the and the scholar. Uh, there are popular books around uh, non mathematical. There's uh, one by Peter Bernstein uh, that uh, that uh, uh, explains all this thing in non. It's called Capital Ideas and explains this in uh, non technical terms. And but there's other uh, books around. Uh, you know, I don't have a list of them right now. That uh, uh, do you know how how to invest? I know uh, uh, Roger Gibson has a book on asset allocation that's now in the fifth edition, which is you know uh, for a, for a popular audience. All right, so we will put links to that at the show notes of today's show. And I know that you also have your your own website. What what is your yes? Your... If you if you Google. Harry Markowitz, you're likely to get one of my clients who, you know, if it's bigger than me, like UCSD or uh, or Guided Choice or Research Affiliates or somebody like that. Uh, but if you Google Harry Markowitz company, 
then you'll get a page out of my website, which then you know has a link back to the homepage, and you'll you'll see uh, you know my my prizes and my publications and um, the, my my two very able uh, secretaries at Harry Markowitz Company. All that's there. Okay, and we will put links to that at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinungelt.com. Dr. Markowitz, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show. 